All right, we are live. I've got Dr. Tyler Barron, who's also a PhD and an MSc. So I'm super excited today to have you aboard, Tyler. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to be here. Would you just start a little bit with your background in hydrogen and how you heard about it and where you are going in the future? Sure. So I got involved in this area back in 2009, um, and I first learned about alkaline ionized water. And it was interesting because I heard a lot of stories and a lot of benefits about this. And this is before I um, really started my studies in you know, biochemistry and physiology, which is what I got my degrees in. Um, but it was really exciting and I wanted to understand it. And I remember talking to a lot of different, you know, so-called gurus or experts or people, but really just people who were selling a lot of machines, I guess, um, about why the water works or how is it, what, what is the mechanism? And, you know, it seemed that people were quite confident with the answers, but, um, <laughs> but nobody really knew they were all, you know, kind of contradicting each other. And, as I continue trying to understand it, I, I when I got back to the university, I was like, well, I'll just ask, you know, some of my professors and pretty much everything that I brought up to them from you know, the, all, the benefit of alkaline pH or microclustering or a different surface tension or, you know, whatever it is, they, they pretty much not only said it was not true, but they had, took the time and explained why that's impossible, why it's why it can't be true. And I was like, man, okay. So then you know, is, this, is this just totally placebo or what's going on here? And so I wanted to, you know, I guess the first thing in science is to, to demonstrate if such a phenomena really occurs, to demonstrate if there really are benefits. And if there are, then you, then you investigate for the mechanism, you know, for, for what, what is it um, accounting responsible for those benefits. So I, I ended up doing a little study and I found um, in this in this study that yes, the water was exerting a benefit. So now I was like, okay, so it appears like it, something's really happening here. Now I got to figure out why. And as I was doing research on this alkaline ionized water, or in, in a technical terms, it's called electrolyzed reduced water. Well, I found that, you know, when you do electrolysis of water, you do make hydrogen gas. I mean, that is the definition of electrolysis, the decomposition of water into its hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, right? So as doing this research, I then came across molecular hydrogen or hydrogen gas. And there were a number of publications showing that molecular hydrogen had therapeutic effects. One of the first papers was published in 2007 in a very prestigious scientific journal called Nature Medicine. And this article uh, demonstrated that hydrogen um, could be inhaled or even dissolved into, into solution and exert therapeutic antioxidant effects. And that's when I'm like, voila, like maybe this explains it. Like maybe there are other benefits, but molecular hydrogen certainly would be one of them. And so throughout the years, I systemically, you know, um, investigated all those different parts, whether the surface tension or whether it's the microclustering things or whether it's, you know, electron ideas, there's all the different things out there and found that well really it's just the hydrogen gas that is responsible for the benefits of molecular hydrogen and this is not just my research but research has been done hundreds of studies all throughout japan korea china uh, malaysia there's a number of them that's been done um but but so so there's that aspect that um, we can talk a bit more about but when i uh, because i did some of this research i had the opportunity to go to japan um, in 2013 as part of actually a requirement for my degree in biochemistry. And I was able to research at uh, Nagoya University molecular hydrogen. And I learned a lot about the culture and the history be behind hydrogen, between behind uh, alkaline ionized water and, and all those areas. Met a lot of amazing researchers and top academic scientists who were publishing these articles. And it was a really exciting time. So when I came back in 2013, that's when I started Molecular Hydrogen Institute, which is a science-based nonprofit, so that I could educate the public about molecular hydrogen. And so it started out just a website. Now, now it is, like I said, it's a science-based nonprofit focused on this. Um, and But I really, I guess, fell in love with molecular hydrogen and wanted to study it more. And so I ended up doing a master's degree um, um, where I did a thesis studying molecular hydrogen and then later did a PhD in physiology um, where we also studied molecular hydrogen. 
And I'm still involved in academia, and I currently teach um, right now at the university. Um, I teach, you know, the master's class in exercise and sports, nutrition, and bioenergetics area. I've taught chemistry and um, exercise physiology. So, you know, I like I like teaching. I like researching, and I'm happy to share some of the information and things that we have found through a lot of our academic studies on molecular hydrogen and on the area of alkaline ionized water. Awesome. And I know with the Molecular Hydrogen Institute, because of the study courses, I actually offer it for our affiliates now when they come in to get the correct information. So I just want to talk a little bit um, for those of you that are that are on the chat, make sure that you're chatting, asking any questions, because we are going to be giving out a free ticket for one of you to go to the Molecular Hydrogen Institute, where we have the top leaders here, like Tyler, going to be there being a speaker for us, a guest speaker. So that's April 29th and April 30th. So with that being said, I did a YouTube video, gosh, probably about four months ago, that just basically went through the same information you talk about in your studies about there's no such thing as microclustering, the pH of the water is not affecting your body's pH and many other things. And so because of that video, it's been getting s almost 70,000 views as organic video and lots of people are coming to you even, coming to me saying, hey, what's the deal here? So why do you think there got got to be so much misinformation in the marketplace about this alkaline ionized water? Oh, that is a great question. And just just a quick clarification: the, the, these articles that I published, they are not studies; they are comprehensive review articles of other studies. Okay, mm -hmm. there are literally like uh, over a hundred studies. If you look at the references that go through all of those studies. And I, I combined the results, essentially, of all of those studies. And this is why we're able to, to say definitively that it is the molecular hydrogen that is responsible, exclusively responsible, for the therapeutic benefits in alkaline ionized water. Okay, It's also responsible for the negative ORP. Most people who, who know anything about the water, they know that you have to have a negative ORP. Well... Hydrogen gas is responsible for the negative ORP, and it's responsible for the therapeutic benefits. But just because you have a negative ORP doesn't necessarily mean you have high levels of hydrogen gas, which we can talk about later. It, but point is, these are not studies, but comprehensive uh, review articles that look at all the literature. You and 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 some of the some of the studies actually have used um, one of the more common brands, you know, in Magic Kangen Water, who use mm -hmm. those machines, and also found just like all the other studies that when you remove the hydrogen gas from the water all those therapeutic benefits are eliminated it just goes back to drinking normal filtered controlled water okay mm -hmm. so drinking water of course is great for you right so you're comparing you know water with hydrogen gas to filtered water and when you remove the hydrogen gas from the water even though it has a high ph or whatever else um those benefits are eliminated when the molecular hydrogen is removed Okay, but now to your question. This is this is key. This is key. Why is it then that there is so much misinformation about alkaline ionized water? The answer, in my opinion, is quite simple. And that is because alkaline ionized water was shown to have therapeutic benefits way back in the 1930s. Okay, for like agriculture. In the 1960s, it was approved by the Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare um, because it showed to have benefits. And then around the 1980s, it was getting very popular. In the 1990s, some scientific research really started and really started showing that this water had therapeutic, antioxidant, um, anti-diabetic, anti-cancer effects, like all these different things. Studies after studies were coming out of Japan and Korea and some other places. It was really exciting. Hmm. The issue was nobody knew how it was possible. M most academic scientists and medical doctors, they knew, well, it's not the pH. Like mm -hmm. it's not the alkaline pH. And in fact, most of the studies, it's kind of funny, but you know, when you do a study like in cell culture, okay, you have like a Petri dish and you put cells in there and you add the water. Mm. If you give an alkaline pH of like pH 10 you and you make the cells to be that alkaline, that's going to kill the cells like mm. immediately. If, if, if the pH were to get going, to, if the pH at the cellular level were like a pH of, you know, nine or 10, I mean, it's going to kill the cells. So in, in most of these studies, the pH is first neutralized to the pH of you know, 7.4 or so. So uh, it doesn't really make any sense how somebody could ever have said 
oh, the benefits is from the alkaline water when actually the alkaline pH was neutralized in all these cell culture studies in the first place. Mm, but, but the question then remained, why then was the alkaline ionized water good for you? What is the therapeutic agent for this? And that's, and nobody thought about hydrogen gas. Remember, this was not known until 2007, okay? So nobody knew about this. So they're teaching, mm. they're, they're finding the benefits. Um, people are talking about the benefits, but nobody knew why. And so this different idea is that, well, maybe when the water goes over the electrodes and somehow the water structure get changed or something like this happens, they just just ideas, just conjecture, right? And so then those ideas were investigated. And like, okay, so if the water structure is actually changed, then we should be able to test that with, yeah. say, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Well, mm -hmm. they did a study there, and then they found, oh, look, there's a change, but it turned out that's not a valid test of water structure. It actually changes the function of pH. And they thought, well, okay, but what if we put it in like a tea, for example, look, that you, you can make tea. And then it seems like it's great evidence that it's microclustered or something. Well... As you know, that that's also a function of pH because you know T acts just like a natural pH indicator, and that's why you can, you know, si simply you know take the take the tea bag and put it into um, water with baking soda, and it'll get some tea. Or if you or if you add a little bit of acid, then the color disappears and so on. It's just a natural pH indicator, so that doesn't work. And but but then many other much more complicated tests, you know, Raymond spectroscopy and other ways to really get into the water structure um, were, were, were done. All of them showed that there is no different structure of the water. There's no microclustering. None of that works at all. So then why is it that this water would provide therapeutic effects? Still, it was not known that molecular hydrogen was responsible. And so they looked at other things, well, maybe maybe it's some you know increased energy or, or entropy, or maybe it's this or that. Anyway, just go in all these different directions. And then that one person thought, well, maybe it's atomic hydrogen or called active hydrogen. Mm -hmm. People call it active hydrogen. Mm -hmm. That is atomic hydrogen. And that came because it was thought that hydrogen gas, which is a stable neutral molecule, won't have any biological effects. This was a common belief for a long time. And so they thought, well, maybe it's atomic hydrogen. Somehow, somehow maybe atomic hydrogen is existing in the water that's connected to some you know, platinum or mineral hydrides or something like this. And then that was investigated. And lo and behold, it was found that actually there was no atomic hydrogen that atomic hydrogen is so reactive that it quickly forms another hydrogen and it is a free radical so it, just, it doesn't last very long it reacts immediately and then finally this article was published in nature medicine showing that hydrogen gas this neutral hydrogen molecule molecular hydrogen itself could exert therapeutic effects and when and that that right there is what caused the researchers in the alkaline ionized water community to realize, okay, maybe the benefits are molecular hydrogen. And that's when st researchers started removing hydrogen gas from the water and testing it. And they found that all the benefits were eliminated when we remove the hydrogen gas. So to sum up the answer to your question, why was there so much misinformation? It's because the water worked and nobody knew why. And so all these conjectures and hypotheses were you know talked about like it was known but it wasn't known if you look at the articles it even says we don't know but now we do know it's the hydrogen gas and now we can focus on molecular hydrogen yeah that's awesome so i remember when i was back in enagic and i was you know i heard about these things that possibly the microclustering wasn't accurate and you know some other things too so i've kind of bounced information off of you because we've been friends on facebook for quite some time he's like yeah that's not accurate but it was so challenging because the story got so big, you know, so here I am trying to tell somebody and then, you know, other people are like, oh, but this and that. And then it's like, OK, well, I might as well not even bother because it doesn't seem like it's making any difference here. They're still going to believe what everybody else is saying. And so yeah. that's one of my passions. And it was is yours, too, is like we got to correct the marketplace and reeducate people to focus now on the hydrogen, not the alkalinity or any other aspect of the water so that we can gain trust and credibility with doctors and healthcare practitioners and other places so we can get this out to the public. Absolutely, you know, and it's, it is very sad when you consider that, you know, people determine what is truth, not based upon 
credible scientific studies, but based on popularity or how often you know they hear some hear, hear a claim. That's not how truth is established. It's based upon systematic, you know, credible scientific publications, the scientific method. And you're absolutely right. You know, when you go to a, a, a doctor, an academic, and you say something about this water has these properties of microclustering and structuring and um, you know alkaline pH they're, they're going to laugh you right out because there is not only no scientific evidence to support it there is also an abundant scientific evidence to refute it I mean do you realize that if water were actually microclustered you would not be able to have hydration because the, the 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 aquaporin that the water molecules go in is smaller than a microcluster. I mean, water is in the size of a nanometer, and so it, none of it makes sense at any level if you just sit back and think about it. And research has been done showing that, you know, like with water, it enters the aquaporin at in a linear, single fashion way, not as a cluster. It has to go one by one, not even touching each other. You know, you can't have a water cluster. If you had a water cluster, that's gonna prevent, that's going to impede hydration, actually. So it's very, mm -hmm. very problematic. The only time we have water clusters is when we have ice. That That is what a microcluster is, you know? So and, and anyway, so there's no like therapeutic effects of, you know, bulk phase and microcluster, so to speak. Um, so yes, if you were to say this to a doctor, they're going to they're gonna laugh and it doesn't make any sense. But if you were to say to them something like, hey, um, it turns out that molecular hydrogen, the gas, um, has really interesting therapeutic antioxidant effects and, and people in throughout the world that you know, inhale this gas and they've used it, you know, and you can show them a bunch of studies and then you can say, turns out you can also dissolve it in water and drink it. So the water becomes a carrier of, of hydrogen gas. And this also has therapeutic effects. W would you like to look at some of the peer reviewed scientific studies? And the doctor will say, well, sure, send them my way. And then he'll look at the studies and and then he, you know, you, we, we should trust people that they themselves can um, be wise enough to determine the, the risk to benefit ratio, right? You know, what is the safety of this versus what are the potential benefits? I mean, that's really why I'm passionate about this area. It's not because we've somehow proven that hydrogen gas is going to, you know, is the most therapeutic thing in the world and everything. It's just hydrogen is very, it's very safe. And, and the risk to benefit ratio you know, is very favorable so that those who want to try, you know, do all they can for their health and their longevity and, you know, anything that, that's going on with them, this is something they can easily and safely do. And and the, the possible upside is very high. And the possible downside is just there's no benefits. Like that's a very easy, you know, calculus sort of to do in your, in, you know. Absolutely. So those of you that are live with us, make sure that you're asking good questions here because we're going to go through in a minute the questions. One thing that sparked into my mind when you were talking about the uh, the different ways people spread the word is like there could be consequences for some of these actions as well. I know when I was in the company, there was a lot of people drinking a gallon a day of 11.5 because they were told, hey, you got stage free to one cancer, whatever it is. Cancer can't live in this alkaline environment. So drink a whole gallon of this 11.5. And there is some major risks if you want to go through that a little bit. Yeah, that, that is very risk. I mean, there's one just drinking a lot of water, right? P people, you can look it up. You know, people have died from water intoxication. It happens every year. People have died doing this, just drinking too much water. It dilutes the sodium, the electrolyte, that what carries, you know, the you know, for your neurons, for your brain, everything to work, right? If you dilute those sodium levels, you get hyponatremia and you can die. It's fatal. So that's one risk is just water intoxication. The other is... You know, if you're drinking extremely high pH water like that, then you can easily neutralize a small amount of acid in the stomach, and then that can in turn cause create create problems. And we talk about this, um, some of these risks involved with that in the articles that, that we published. And this is not just me coming coming and saying this. Like I didn't even do the research on this. This is me citing not just other studies, but the government, the Japanese and Korean government. They're the ones who made this as a mandated statement because of the clinical trial showing that if you drink water, this super high pH, then you run the risk of developing things like hyperkalemia and, and other areas, which physiologically doesn't quite make sense because if you were to increase blood pH, you would actually have hypo or low uh, potassium levels. Mm -hmm. But in this case, they're finding hyper or high blood potassium levels. So something very strange is going on and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. potassium chloride injections, increasing potassium levels is how 
is how you administer a lethal injection because it immediately stops the heart, for example. It's, it's mm -hmm. a very dangerous thing. And that's why if you look at uh, the owner's manual and, and, and the machines themselves, it specifically says if you have kidney issues or other issues, you can develop hyperkalemia, high blood potassium levels. You have to be, it's, it's a very concerning thing. And it's a real concern that the governments have put out. And the company itself specifically says it because it is a well-established concern. It's not me saying it. I'm just putting it into the article because it's part of what everybody knows. Um, and then, you know, and then people think, well, you know, but yeah, but if you're, maybe those are those risks, but because um, cancer can't survive in an alkaline environment, maybe, you know, I'm going to try it anyway. Well, that's also not true. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not sure why or how this myth started that cancer can't thrive in an alkaline environment. That's just completely not true. People try to cite Dr. Otto Warburg, but his research clearly demonstrates that cancer thrives just as well in an alkaline or acidic environment as well as an oxygen-rich or oxygen-poor environment. That is what made cancer so crazy because it can thrive without oxygen or in oxygen. It doesn't need to have oxygen to th thrive so well because it undergoes glycolysis, which is anaerobic um, respiration, anaerobic metabolism. So it's simply not true that cancer can't thrive in an alkaline environment. In fact, think about smoking, all right? That causes cancer. But if you smoke, that that um, tobacco smoke is extremely alkalizing. It can damage and alkalize parts of your, um, like your, your, uh, your, your esophagus and part of your lungs and your mouth. It, it's an alkalizing agent. And, and many, if you look it up, alkalizing agents and cancer risk, you know, it, it can cause cancer. Um, there's uh, cancer itself, because it goes through anaerobic metabolism, produces a lot of acid, it actually develops ways to excrete the acid out of the cell very quickly. And that makes the cancer cell itself become alkaline. So mm -hmm. alkalosis or alkalinization of a cancer cell is one of the hallmarks of a tumor or, or, or of a metastasis and progression. So again, like in any way that we want to talk about this, it's just completely wrong that alkaline water is somehow going to you know, benefit the cancer. Um, there are some serious risks with 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 doing um, what some people have recommended with drinking lots of high pH alkaline ionized water. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring you out and, and let people know. I just had a client come in, oh, probably about a week and a half ago. Both her and her husband, they're 82, 83 years old. They are like, all right, man, what's going on? We both have cancer and we've been drinking this water religiously. And I'm like, well, have you been cleaning it is the first question. No, they haven't never cleaned it. I'm like, okay, they've had it for like 11 or 12 years. I'm like, oh my gosh. So yeah, it's like they believe that they were not going to ever have cancer because they had this water machine. Because there's tons of information if you go online even with type in alkaline water and cancer. And you're going to see all these people saying, oh yeah, you your body's going to you know have no chance to get cancer in that environment. And um, so I think that's where it starts too. As people start doing their research, they start coming across maybe um people that don't aren't credible and they're just not knowing specifically what water it is that we have right well and and it also becomes a little more complicated because there has been um a a terrible thing that has happened where people have lumped all the good foods that you that you know of, you know fibers and fruits and vegetables and you know plant-based food or whatever um anything that you, anything that you would consider good is called alkaline and anything that you consider bad is called acidic and that couldn't be further from the truth. But if we categorize good, if the good foods as alkaline and bad foods, you know, refined sugars and, you know, toxins and drugs and all this stuff as acidic, then, then by that definition, which is completely wrong, hijacking, commandeering the definition that we, you know, every, everybody is familiar with, and then substituting your own definition, well then, yeah, that would be correct. But it doesn't make any sense, right? And so, so often people believe that because it is true that if you eat healthy food, then your risk of getting cancer decreases. And it's also a good you know, treatment, so to speak, for cancer as opposed to eating bad food. But it's not just alkaline or acidic, you know. So I think that also contributes. And it's it's sad what you're saying you know, with, the, with this couple because they they bought they bought this machine on false pretenses, for example. Now, there, there is absolutely no evidence to support that. In fact, there is direct evidence, and there are literally walking examples mm -hmm. uh, that contradict that very, those very claims, right? And the fact that they haven't been cleaning the machine is even, you know, more uh, 
problematic because that means that they're not getting probably not getting any of the dissolved hydrogen gas because if you don't clean your machines frequently that concentration of hydrogen gas continues to decrease and, and most people already know that most people know that for whatever reason every time they clean the machine they start feeling great again and now we know why it's because of the molecular hydrogen so you know it, it's a very good point you brought up yeah, well, there's so many good points that we're going to go through at the Hydrogen University. So all of you that are hearing this for the first time on the recording, you got to check it out. Go to healthyhydration.com. You'll see events tab. Click on that tab. It's going to give you all the information about the event. My birthday is the 28th, and I'm going to turn 28 again. I keep laughing about that. It's going to be 39. Oh, my gosh. So we're going to celebrate my birthday, and then we're going to have our two-day event, and it's at the Palms Casino and Resort there in Las Vegas. So we're going to have... Dr. Tyler here. We're going to have Taiwan Hubbard, Bob Centronelli. I just uh, got a mindset coach for everyone that are affiliates. His name is Bill Banta. He worked with Bob Proctor. It's going to be a super fun event. I know a lot of you are making comments over here on the right, so we'll go through those comments here and we will finish it up. So let's go ahead and start with Denmark. All right, Marvin. That's awesome. All right, Callie. If it was known that it wasn't the pH. How did the concept get? Okay, so popular, good one. Okay, can you imagine atomic hydrogen? That's funny. Yeah, uh, so uh, should we talk about atomic hydrogen? Yes, and active hydrogen. Yeah, so atomic hydrogen and active hydrogen is the same thing. Active hydrogen comes from a mistranslation of the Japanese of a reactive hydrogen. Reactive hydrogen is atomic hydrogen, and it's called, it's reactive because it is a free radical. You learn about this in the courses, actually. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and like I said, because it was believed for a long time that molecular hydrogen, right, which is neutral and not reactive, does, did not have any biological effects. That's what a lot of people believed. And so it was assumed that maybe atomic hydrogen or reactive hydrogen existed somehow in the water and was somehow stabilized. And then as research progressed, it turned out that was not the case. It does not exist. So the benefits were actually exclusively due to molecular hydrogen. You know, I heard back from the past, it was going through my mind. It's like when I was watching someone do a presentation, a very up, um, up to do person and saying, um, you know, that people were going to these places in the, in the world and then they were examining the water and there was all this active hydrogen in it. And that was really the main, you know, thing was that active hydrogen. It's just funny how that story got spread and then it did too. Yeah, well, it, it is it is interesting, and that's because some of these places, if they measure a negative ORP, and people just assume that that means it has active hydrogen in it, or atomic hydrogen, which it doesn't mean that. It could mean it has some hydrogen sulfide, which also has beneficial effects, as well as um, molecular hydrogen. And indeed, some of these waters do have some small amounts of molecular hydrogen in, in the water. So there could be some truth to, to that area. Um, not as much as it's been, you know, extrapolated to be, for example, but it is an interesting story nonetheless. You know, what is interesting is that the bottled water industry, I was doing some research yesterday and I was just astonished by how many bottles of water we're going through because every minute we're going through like 461,000 bottles of water. Wow. And then there was a bunch of, um, alkaline water bottle manufacturing companies that, you know, they're doing a huge volume as well. And so do you think there's going to be a time here where we're not going to hear about alkaline water in the bottle anymore? It's going to start to be hydrogen water in the bottle? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I think that, that the reason why the alkaline water bottle took off was because of the benefits that were observed starting mainly in Japan on drinking alkaline ionized water. And then when this gets translated from the scientist, the academic person, and then the salesperson, and then the, the bottled water companies, they think, oh, well, we'll just make alkaline water and we'll sell it. And that would have no benefits. I mean, there could be benefits with minerals and stuff. And, you know, and we don't need to talk about that right now. But the alkaline pH itself is not going to have any benefits. But because of all the benefits that were observed in the studies and by people talking about in the industry that, you know, that, that many of these companies built, that kind of acted as the foundation of building all this bottled alkaline water. But, but as we talked about, there's no molecular hydrogen in bottled alkaline water, even if they use commercial water ionizers. And indeed, many of the larger companies that sell alkaline, alkaline water in bottles, they use commercial alkaline water ionizers because mm -hmm. they're under the impression that somehow that process imparts some 
you know, magical substance or something into the water that stays stable. Um, but it turns out the magical substance is just hydrogen gas, so not really magical. Actually, it kind of is. Um, but it's all your definition of magic, I guess. Yes. So, but, but, yeah, and to your question, then, yes, I think because of the clear research now over, you know, well over 2,000 publications on molecular hydrogen and its therapeutic effects, you know, then, yes, we, we will eventually see, you know, ready to drink um, hydrogen water products and hydrogen infused beverages. You know, that is much more uh, prominent than alkaline water ever was because there's actually legitimate potential benefits and scientific research to back this up. So it's it's exciting. It's exciting to be, a, you know, with like you, your company, to be a trailblazer in building this awareness and this this new, um, you know, upcoming industry. Absolutely. It's so fun, too. OK, another question. OK, why is pre-filtering water um, necessary? Why wouldn't you just want to drink a bunch of chlorine and other contaminants in your water and then put hydrogen in it? Um, I mean, you could, but it, it, just, it just, it really depends on how uh, problematic your, your tap water is. And in a lot of places, you know, the tap water is not as bad as say drinking, you know, lake water or certain types of well water or something. I mean, it is, the, the tap water has to, has to um, reach certain regulations of the city. And unfortunately, often those regulations are, are, you know, not that great or different things happen. And so you just want to be cautious about that to remove some of those uh, contaminants because that could harm, harm your health. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, when we're talking about hydrogen gas, we, we assume you, you already understand the benefits of filtration and then, and the, and when it is needed to do that. So then, so you're adding molecular hydrogen into already clean filtered water. Excellent. Awesome. All right. So I just got a couple more questions here to go down. Let's see. Um, explain about diabetes and how hydrogen can help people with diabetes. Okay. Um, there's a lot of studies on this and, and so still more, more research needs to be done again. Um, but a couple of interesting things with, with people with diabetes, they have very high glucose levels and sometimes um, their insulin levels can either be uh, too high or they can even be too low because their pancreas stops producing the insulin and the glucose isn't really getting into the muscles. Hydrogen can help with pretty much all these steps, all right? So first let's talk about um, insulin and where it's produced. Like I said, it's produced in the pancreas by the beta cells. And if the beta cells get damaged or if they're, you know, being overactive all the time. So like with type 2 diabetes, who have diabetes for a long time, the insulin levels go down. And that's why you have to take an exogenous insulin and inject insulin into your body to get those levels up. Hydrogen gas has been shown to increase the secretion of insulin by, uh, by protecting and improving the beta cells of the pancreas. Okay, so that's one thing that's happening right there is you're able to get more insulin secretion from the beta cells of the pancreas, all right? Then when the, what happens is insulin is kind of this key that works as like a key basically that, that's going to go onto the skeletal muscle tissue into this GLUT4 transporter basically and induce this translocation of a glucose transporter. So insulin binds and then the transporter comes out, it's able to, to get glucose from the blood and take it in. And with diabetics, that process does not happen very well. Molecular hydrogen can potentiate that process. It can, it can make it work more effectively. In fact, hydrogen can, can induce the GLUT4 translocation in a similar way that insulin can. So it acts like this insulin mimetic and in, inducing um, GLUT4 translocation through a PI3 kinase process. And it's a phosphorylation cascade. But, but it, can, it can exert some of these same effects that insulin can in this way. Um, and then, and then thirdly, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of problems with di diabetes, um, that are consequences of having high hyperinsulinemia and, um, hyperglycemia and molecular hydrogen might be able to reduce some of those negative side effects, um, from having diabetes in the first place. So there are a number of clinical studies that have showed that drinking hydrogen water can help to, uh, reduce, uh, excessive levels of blood glucose levels. In fact, we published a study, a six month study, um, a double blinded placebo controlled study in patients um, or subjects with 
metabolic syndrome. And we saw significant decreases in glucose levels and also in hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of uh, glucose levels over time. Um, then another study, one of the earliest ones found uh, um, uh, some that people with impaired glucose tolerance, that hydrogen water normalized, um, let's see, there were six subjects and normalized four out of the six subjects um, glucose tolerance test, um, just drinking hydrogen water. Mm -hmm. So um, again, a number of studies, clinical studies and tons of animal studies. In fact, some animal studies have shown that the effects of hydrogen water are comparable to common anti-diabetic drugs um, like metformin and others. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. It works very well in animals, maybe not quite as well in humans, but um, again, the research is, is quite, uh, quite promising. That is so cool. Yeah, I know when I was going through my health journey, uh, they put me on metformin at one point and I was like, that stuff made me hungry. I remember going to the subway and I ate two foot long sandwiches and I was like, this is not normal. I don't know what they're putting in this drug, but this is not healthy. And hydrogen does the opposite to me. Like I just fast all day now and I just drink the hydrogen water and then I eat dinner and I'm just like, I feel so focused all day, my mental clarity. And I just love the way I feel so much energy too. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. All right. Well, one last question for me. And I think we have one more comment that's coming in here. Um, heart disease, number two leader, or maybe it's number one leader of death here in the U S. Um, how can hydrogen help? Um, yeah, there's lots of different types of heart disease. I and mean, for my PhD, we, uh, you know, we, it was actually in cardiovascular and supervascular diseases. And we actually, um, did, um, heart transplants in, in pigs, adult pigs, and show that molecular hydrogen was very, uh, protective in, in, in this whole transplantation process and, Mm -hmm. um, but so, so, so a lot of things to think about one, you know, with the diabetes, you know, if you're going to be able to decrease your glucose levels and have improved lipid profiles, your cholesterol levels, and you're, um, you're going to have, be able to reduce the risk of, you know, cardiovascular disease, you know, heart disorders and, and problems. You also have, you know, it's, there's one powerful animal study where you had, um, that, um, they would develop, um, atherosclerosis. Um, because mm -hmm. of this mutation I and mean, drinking hydrogen water completely prevented the development of atherosclerosis in the animal study, you know, so, so that's another, you know, pretty compelling area right there. The hydrogen water in humans was shown to increase endothelial function, for example. Um, then a lot of studies have shown with, um, we, uh, well, actually in Japan, I'll, I'll bring this up. The, the treatment of using, using hydrogen gas, um, for the treatment of post cardiac arrest syndrome. So when you, when you have a heart attack or you have to stop the heart, um, then when you start the heart back up, that is when you normally um, cause a lot of damage because it's, it's this ischemia reperfusion injury. Basically mm -hmm. when the blood goes back into the rest of the body, then it comes in with all this oxygen and nutrients and that creates a lot of oxidative damage. And so people end up dying shortly after getting the heart rate, uh, the heart beating again. And so this is the, uh, um, but, well, this, this is a very common thing that's known. And the Japanese government recently approved um, the use of hydrogen gas for the treatment of post-cardiac arrest syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so, they can, so they can do clinical studies, large-scale clinical studies um, in, this, in this area. So it's very exciting. The animal studies are extremely powerful. The current mode of treatment right now is um, therapeutic uh, temperature management. So they maintain like a hypothermic condition and that is very effective when the animal studies when they compare with hydrogen gas um the the, the therapeutic hypothermia was you know like 70 percent effective in preventing death of the of the animals hydrogen gas was like 92 percent effective and then when you combine them together it was 100 percent effective a number of animal studies have shown this and so hopefully we see some similar things in the clinical studies but so far the results do look promising you just have so much knowledge there in your mind. It's like, whew, I just got to grab it all and have to watch this video over and over and over again. Amazing. And with all this terminology that you have too, I have to simplify those words because I know a lot of the words that you say, it's like, I don't know what do you, what do those even mean, but that's yeah, just all right. You'll have to, yeah, I, I'm talking fast and, and it just comes out. So we'll, we'll have to break things down some more. Absolutely. All right. Um, there's another one here from Jolene. What are the therapeutic differences of drinking hydrogen water versus inhalation of H2? And 
what's cool is Jolene has the four in one device that Taiwan Harbor just certified through his company. And it also has the eyes too. So like for diabetes, you know, with people in their eyes, but uh, what's the difference there? What's inhalation versus drinking? Um, yeah, there, I would say there's kind of like an apple to orange comparison in a lot of ways because the route of administration is different and that's going to change the, when you change the pharmacokinetics like that, you change the pharmacodynamics. Maybe that's kind of too complicated. Um, I, I'm just saying that okay. when you drink hydrogen water, it's going you know through the stomach and into the intestines, and that's going to cause certain changes that inhalation is not going to do, and then vice versa. And so that we've seen some studies where certain um, protein expressions were increased by drinking hydrogen water, beneficial protein expressions, whereas they were not with inhalation and vice versa, okay? So th there is a, re a rationale to do, um, to do the, both of them. Um, and, and sometimes the protein expression from um, hydrogen water um, happens much greater than from the inhalation. And so in this way, uh, hydrogen water was like 100 times more effective than the inhalation. So it, it, if you're drinking hydrogen water, that is a good start. I mean, that's, that's primarily what I, what I do when I do it. Um, you know, it's just drinking hydrogen water because it's, it's simple and it's long-term and, and everything. Uh, but there are some additional benefits um, from, from the inhalation. Now, but, but like I said, it's kind of, you know, an apple to orange comparison there. Um, it's not, you can't really say one's better than the other. Maybe eventually be able to get there for specific disease conditions. Um, then we could say that the inhalation is going to be more effective than say drinking hydrogen water. Because there's different pathways in how your body is going to absorb it. Yeah. Yeah. And so someone, let's just imagine has Alzheimer's, would an inhalation device be better for them or would you say drinking? Um, I, I don't know. The research is still not, not conclusive on that right now. There are powerful animal studies on both and some pretty promising human studies actually on both. Mm -hmm. um, this, now, some of the inhalation studies on Alzheimer's or cognitive impairments was very surprising because they actually showed some reversal using um, magnetic tensor imaging of the neuron bundle. And you can look at this and um, you in, inhaling hydrogen gas was able to improve the integrity of the neuron bundle. And then we saw, you know, we as, you know, the study saw some um, significant improvements in memory recall tasks and other things. But, but we also see like another study, specifically those with the APOE4 genotype, which is um, uh, those who have this are more, much more susceptible to developing Alzheimer's disease. And they had, just by drinking hydrogen water, it was for a one-year study, but those with this genotype um, had a significant improvements in their memory recall as well. They didn't, they didn't decrease like the uh, placebo group did. So again, both of them ha seem to have benefits and I can't really say, oh, this one's better than the other one. Uh, you know, at least right now, um, we don't know. Okay, gotcha. There's a good question here. Um... It appears to be a, a wide selection of different hydrogen water bottles out on the marketplace. And especially on Amazon, there's ones that are $40 and there's ones that are like ours, like 250. So can you tell us like, what's the difference and you know, what bottle is going to be legitimate? Um, yeah, it's pretty simple actually, because we know that the only benefit of any of this stuff is the hydrogen gas. Then that's the only thing you need to worry about is what is the concentration of molecular hydrogen and Typically, not always, the higher the concentration, the better. And now you simply need to measure the concentration of molecular hydrogen. And when you get these um, units off of Amazon that are, you know, $20, $40 or whatever, and you measure the concentration, not with an ORP meter or, or some, you know, other inaccurate method, but using a gas chromatography or um, for convenience, the H2 blue, right, the little blue reagent, if you measure that correctly, you'll find that those bottles on average produce less than a half a milligram per liter or sometimes not even detectable levels um, because they, they, they simply don't have the correct infrastructure. They don't have the right, um, you know, membrane. They're not the SPE or solid polymer electrolyte, you know, a, a chamber, for example. Um, I mean, these, these are very expensive components. When you talk about not just the platinum, but the membrane and the whole setup and assembly itself, an actual product that is correct 
it, the cost of it itself is going to be more than your twenty or thirty dollars. The actual cost of of the of the actual product. So if you're able to buy retail a product that is super low, you know that either a it's not going to work, b if it does, um, it's not going to work for very long, and c if it does, the the materials it's made out of are very low quality and could even be harmful for your health because it's going to degrade very quickly. You're going to get parts of the membrane or parts of the electrodes or parts of you know different things and be ingesting that. You, you don't want any of that. Maybe it's going to be producing you know ozone and chlorine and um, you know oxygen radicals and other things because it doesn't have the correct membrane and, and so on. So again, you just want to have a product that measures consistently a higher concentration of hydrogen. And that's, you know, we don't, with MHI, we don't recommend, um, we don't make any product recommendations or whatever, but we do say, we do encourage that uh, p consumers use products that are certified to IHSA standards, to you know, International Hydrogen Standards Association, to certain, that certain criteria. That way the consumers can know that, hey, um, we're getting the amount of hydrogen that is similar to what is provided in the clinical studies. I'm so excited because our bottle is like this close to getting the certification. It's already passed, but it has to get the final polish or whatnot. So it will be one of those. Great. And we've had many conversations about the bottle. And I know I wanted to compete with the Amazon market. And so I was able to find a manufacturer that was, yeah, Absolutely, we can have something like that. But did you also know that it makes chlorine gas? And I'm like, nope, I'm not going to compromise the price for people's health. Absolutely not. So you absolutely get what you pay for with those bottles online. Yeah. And like I said, because if you don't have the right membrane, you're going to be producing chlorine because you do electrolysis. People who have machines, they know on the one side you're producing hydrogen, the other side you're producing chlorine, right? You can. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the right membrane, you're going to start drinking that. And then like we, I think you and I had talked about before, it's not necessarily just the chlorine that's bad, but when the chlorine reacts with other things, it can make it even har more harmful. For yes, you. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. So we'll be announcing the winner in the next day or so and who wins from the comments here. So congratulations to the new winner. And then last week we had a wonderful general, a wonderful lady more. I can't remember her first name off the top of my head, but uh, congratulations to you. You got an email that went to you with the ticket. So excited for you so anyways anything else tyler to lead us off into the next event no just i'm i'm grateful that you're trying to get the correct information out there and i can share some of the research that i and you know other scientists have done in this area um, i'm very pleased that you've taken a liking to my courses on mhi again these are you know science-based courses where they're also going to be offered through the you know, our local university and through South, southwest technical college it's not just you know one man's opinion trying to you know to say something like this is accredited information so you can have you know true knowledge and have those credentials and and, and so on to really understand all the science and everything and I, I put them together over you know over 10 years of, of learning about this and talking to people and seeing what people need and what what the misinformation is so I'm, I'm glad that you you and others have had such a wonderful experience with the course so far Oh, yeah. We got the team all excited about it. They're doing little videos for me. We're going to play it at the event and just what they've learned and how confident they feel now because they have the accurate information to go out there instead of all this hype. So it's really added so much value to our affiliate program. So thank you so much. Oh, great. Glad to hear it. All right. Well, we'll see you all Thursday. We have Bob Citronelli coming. And so make sure to stay live for that. It's at three o'clock. So we'll see you all then. Have a great rest of your day.